Laureate quickly cast a defense spell thinking she was a goner. But she wasn't about to let Doha meet the same fate. With swift movements, she layered on as much magic as she could to shield him. Doha was in disbelief as he watched Laureate sacrifice herself to protect him. As she accepted her fate, Azrahan's image crossed her mind. In a panic, Doha shielded Laureate's body from the rubble. This is my boy! A crowd had formed to see what was happening. I guess we spot the suspect here. Laureate slowly opened her eyes, surprised to be alive, and saw that Doha had protected her. He looked really mad and yelled, Are you crazy? But Laureate just smiled, relieved that he was okay. Doha was worried sick about her, but Laureate insisted he stay put. She told him not to move and kept reassuring him that everything was going to be okay as she continued to cast her magic to keep the rubble from crushing them. Doha was getting frustrated, so he decided to use his magic to free them from the rubble. He finally showed off his impressive powers and they were both saved. Doha asked Laureate why she did something so foolish. Laureate didn't get what Doha was mad about, so he asked her again why she only cast the spell on him. Laureate wondered why Doha was angry because it was a quick decision and there wasn't much time to think. What mattered was that Doha was safe. Laureate replied to Doha that she did it because he was her friend. Doha was even more surprised when he found out this truth. They had only met a few times and yet Laureate had risked her life for him. Doha wasn't a believer in selflessness or kindness. He thought that everyone acted for their own interests. But when he saw what Laureate had done for him, he was left in disbelief. She wouldn't gain anything by protecting him, even if it meant putting her own life on the line. Laureate suddenly perked up and felt relieved that they both made it out without any injuries. As they stood up, Doha asked her if she was hurt, but Laureate assured him that she was fine. Doha felt annoyed because even though Laureate was wounded, she acted like it was no big deal. He then healed her injuries and scolded her, saying she almost died. But Laureate responded that everyone dies eventually and thanked him for healing her. However, Doha didn't seem pleased with Laureate's response. He told her that she couldn't die because he wouldn't allow it. Wait, are you God? Even though Laureate was fixated on Azrahan, Doha was determined to keep her safe. He advised her not to take any reckless risks that could hurt her. Laureate couldn't help but think that Doha was still processing what had happened earlier. Doha looked at the ruined building and started to wonder what went wrong, since it didn't seem like it would just collapse like that. Lariat was surprised to see Doha so angry she had never seen him like that before. But she was relieved that he was safe. Later on, Lariat finally made it back home to Candle's Manor, feeling completely drained after everything that had happened. Azrahan was already there and greeted her, asking where she had been. Lariat was thrilled to see him and quickly asked for a hug. Azrahan hugged her back, but then noticed something on her and his expression changed. He asked if she had been in an accident. Azrahan told her that he smelled some dirt on her. Lariat was confused as to how he could smell it. She didn't want to worry Azrahan more, so she told him she fell down on the street. Azrahan asked if she was hurt and Lariat said she only had a few scratches, but Doe had healed her. Azrahan checked to make sure she was okay. Then Azrahan asked if Lariat had fun and she said yes, but she enjoyed being with Azrahan the most. Lariat thought Azrahan was cute and was determined to purify his curse quickly to make him happy. When the building almost crushed her, Lariat realized that if she died before breaking the curse, Azrahan would always be faced with nothing but misery. She wouldn't let that happen and was willing to pay any price to break the curse. The next day, Lariat was sitting on Azrahan's lap, ready to do the treatment as she insisted. But Azrahan was worried because she didn't look so good. Lariat told him she was fine. But in reality, she wasn't. She used up all her mana to save Doha before. But she kept telling herself she had to purify Azrahan as soon as possible. The moment Azrahan saw that Laureate wasn't feeling well, he grabbed her hand to stop her. All of a sudden, Laureate lost her balance and fell right into Azrahan's body. She told him she was feeling cold. Azrahan panicked and tried to warm her up with a hug. But then Laureate said she needed a warm bath and Azrahan quickly scooped her up and was about to ask the maid to draw the water. However, Laureate pulled him closer and asked him to stay with her while she bathed since she didn't trust the maid. 
Azrahan blushed hard and had no clue what Laureate meant. But then she explained that she just needed a friend to keep her company and that she would stay clothed while bathing. As Azrahan understood that Laureate was trying her best to help him despite her own condition, he decided not to bail out because he felt too shy. Azrahan asked Laureate if the water was warm enough. Laureate replied that the temperature was fine, but she got upset because Azrahan was sitting with his back to her. Azrahan explained that he needed to do it for his own sake. Laureate got frustrated and suddenly grabbed Azrahan's arm, warning him that if he ran away again, she would do the same. She put on a stern face, which made Azrahan turn his back to her and ask if she was serious, shocking Laureate. But Laureate quickly changed the mood by saying that she meant running around the mansion like playing tag. Azrahan apologized for misunderstanding her, and told her that he thought about tying her up if it was serious. Laureate assumed that Azrahan was kidding. You were joking, weren't you? Azrahan smiled upon hearing that. Seeing his smile, Laureate playfully asked him to wash her, which caught Azrahan off guard. Azrahan's face turned pale as he thought about washing Laureate's body. Hey, you dirty mind. But then Laureate clarified that she only wanted him to wash her hair. Azrahan felt relieved and began to wash her hair gently, being careful not to cause any harm. Suddenly, he noticed a scar on Laureate's neck and asked her about it. Laureate told him that when she was young, Rayan pushed her down the stairs and lied to their parents about what had happened. Her parents scolded her because they thought she was trying to challenge Rayan for succession. Azrahan felt upset after hearing the story and wished he had at least smashed one of Rayan's hands back then. Lariette continued her story, telling Azrahan that she was locked in a room as punishment and was forced to endure it. Her mother said it was to help her develop patience, so all she could do was wait. Lariette switched gears and asked Azrahan if he had any issues with her hair color, since someone apparently complained that it hurt their eyes to look at her pink lock. Azrahan asked her who said such nonsense, as he would love to give them a piece of his mind. But Laureate insisted he answer her question, and he told her he couldn't not like it. Laureate was happy to hear that, and Azrahan was stunned by her smile. She then teased him, asking if he thought only her hair was pretty. Azrahan blushed and said that everything about her was beautiful. Laureate drew closer to him and asked him to kiss the places he found most beautiful. He kissed her hair and told her that there was no place on her that wasn't lovely. Then he kissed her hand and asked if he should kiss her everywhere. Lariette playfully teased him, telling him to start with the most lovely place. Azrahan leaned in and kissed her lips. A few days later, they were bickering outside the boutique, with Lariette teasing Azrahan to help her try on clothes, but he declined, suggesting that Madame Charb could assist her instead. Lariette playfully hit him, calling him mean, but it was more like a massage for Azrahan. Suddenly, Gerard emerged from behind the building and signaled to Azrahan. Seeing this, Azrahan asked Lariette to go inside first and said he would be back with her shortly. As soon as Lariette walked into the boutique, she saw Madame Sharb looking all puzzled and glancing at someone behind her. And then, BAM! Lariette was completely shocked to find her own mother standing there. Shocked by the situation, Laureate was taken aback and tried to keep her cool as she greeted her mother with a long time no see. Her mother rushed up to her, grabbing her shoulder and expressing concern for Laureate. With a worried look on her face, she asked where Laureate had been all this time, emphasizing how worried she was. But Laureate had reached her limit with her mother's theatrics. She quickly brushed off her mother's hand and questioned her mother's concern asking how someone who claimed to worry about her could show no signs of sadness and still indulge in fancy things like shopping at a high-end boutique. Her mother came up with an excuse, saying it was because she was a duchess and it was her obligation to do all those things. Feeling like her mother was spewing a bunch of bullshit, Lariette bluntly stated that she had never seen the Blanche family make any effort to advertise missing people in the newspaper or anywhere else. This time, her mother played the victim card, claiming she couldn't do anything about it because of her father's authority. Lariette pondered her mother's words, but that didn't mean she was easily convinced. If her mother genuinely cared about her, she believed there had to be something more she could do to find her. Lariette accused her mother of making up excuses when she was actually capable of doing better. 
The anger inside her began to boil, even though her mother kept apologizing. Laureate couldn't see any sincerity in those apologies, viewing her mother as just as terrible as the rest of her family. Lariette struggled to contain her emotions as they were on the verge of exploding. Unable to hold it in any longer, she bolted for the exit door while her mother desperately tried to stop her. Lariette kept running aimlessly with the only thought in her mind being to escape that hellish situation. Her mind went blank as she ran, gasping for breath, but refusing to stop. Suddenly, someone grabbed her arm from behind. Softly calling her name, Azrahan ran to catch up with her. His voice carried both concern and worry. His tone abruptly changed. His expression darkened as he asked who had made Lariat cry, then gently wiping away her tears. Lariat leaned her face against his hand, feeling an immense sense of relief and gratefulness that she still had Azrahan by her side. Not wanting to burden him further, she insisted that she hadn't cried. Embracing Azrahan, she concocted a reason for her dash, claiming she couldn't wait any longer to see him and that she missed him so much. But Azrahan saw right through her lie. He then invited her to go back home. In her jumbled emotions, Azrahan's hug felt like an oasis in the desert, a glimmer of hope for a better life, even though she knew her time in this world was limited. Days later, Azrahan noticed that something was off with Laureate. She didn't seem like her usual self. She even needed to be asked for a hug, whereas she used to run up to Azrahan begging for a daily hug. Lately, she appeared really down. Azrahan felt completely helpless. He wanted nothing more than to spend the whole day with Laureate, but he had an emergency meeting regarding the war that he couldn't skip. Despite being lovers now, Azrahan wished Laureate would share her burdens with him. But what could he do when Laureate herself didn't want to? Sitting by the window, Laureate had a gloomy expression as she clutched a letter in her hand. It was from Madame Charba who apologized and expressed guilt towards her. Madame Charba explained that Laureate's mother had relentlessly begged her to deliver the letter, promising it would be the last time. In the letter, Duchess Blanche expressed regret for not properly stopping Laureate on that day. She mentioned there were many things she wanted to say to Laureate, and pleaded for her to spare some time to meet. She provided the time and place for their meeting that day. Laureate's anger boiled over, causing her to crush the letter in her hand. She felt a wave of dejection wash over her as she questioned why her mother suddenly acted like she cared, but hadn't shown any concern when Laureate was still with them. The clock showed that it was already ten minutes past five. Lariette's mother had been waiting at the restaurant she mentioned in the letter. As Lariette walked into the room, her mother's face lit up with relief that she had finally arrived. The food was already on the table, ready to be eaten as Lariette took her seat. In an attempt to show her care, Duchess Blanche offered Lariette some food to try. However, memories of past events flooded Lariette's mind. She remembered her mother telling her to stop eating in order to maintain a slim body, and the last family dinner when Rayan refused to eat with her, leading her mother to instruct Lariat to return to her room immediately. But now, her mother seemed so different. Trying to keep a smile on her face in front of Lariat and encouraging her to eat heartily. However, Lariat remained unaffected by her mother's sudden change in behavior. She got straight to the point and asked her mother what she wanted to say making it clear that she would only listen and then leave quickly. Duchess Blanche was taken aback by Laureate's directness. Lowering her head, Duchess Blanche apologized, expressing regret for not paying enough attention to Laureate and not taking proper care of her. She realized the value of Laureate only after losing her and acknowledged that nobody in the family truly cared about her, instead blaming her for everything related to household matters. With deep remorse, Duchess Blanche admitted that Laureate was the only one who genuinely cared about her, but her own actions had driven Laureate away. Laureate closed her eyes, suppressing her anger, realizing that her mother didn't truly grasp the pain she had caused. However, she stood up abruptly, ready to leave. She made it clear that she had listened to her mother's apology, but that didn't mean she would return to the Blanche family. Duchess Blanche looked helpless 
offering her sincere apologies as Lariat headed towards the exit door. However, it turned out to be a trap. Lauriette had been lured into this meeting by her mother's invitation and now found herself trapped there. Lauriette was completely taken aback as she desperately fought against the people restraining her. With no other option, one of them silenced Lauriette with a forceful blow to her back. She crumpled and fell to the ground while her mother sat still, doing nothing. Just then, Duke Blanche emerged, accompanied by his men who swiftly removed Lauriette from the scene. Casting a menacing glare at the unconscious Lariette, he turned to Duchess Blanche with an evil grin and declared that a mere apology wasn't the proper way to bring back a missing child. Inside the Blanche residence, Lariette struggled relentlessly to free herself from the handcuffs binding her hands. But no matter how hard she tried, they wouldn't budge even a bit. She couldn't believe her own parents would do such a thing to her. Going as far as locking her magic powers, too. Feeling utterly helpless, Lariette sank to her knees on the floor and let out a heavy sigh. <sighs> Weak from not eating since yesterday, she sat near the door, realizing there was little she could do in her current state. Suddenly, a soft whisper reached her ears from outside the room. Recognizing the voice as Anne's, her former maid, a glimmer of hope flickered in Lariette's eyes. Anne stood before the door, asking about Lauriette's condition with genuine concern. Lauriette reassured Anne that she was okay. Through the closed door, they exchanged updates and asked about each other's well-being. However, Anne then asked if there was anything she could do to help. She informed Lauriette that Duke Blanche had gone mad, declaring the previous night that he would not allow Lauriette to live in peace. Tears streaming down her face, Anne vowed to seek assistance, but Lariette quickly urged her not to, expressing her fear that harm might befall Anne as well. Feeling remorse for the past, Anne confessed to Lariette that she deeply regretted not being able to help her when she was injured and left the Blanche residence. Now, Anne was determined to lend a hand to ensure she wouldn't have any regrets in the future. Lariette was touched by Anne's words, torn between hope and resignation. Knowing that her time was limited, she yearned to experience happiness and contentment, even if just for a little while. As Anne stood up, she revealed her plan to speak to Joel, the magician teacher in the Blanche house. She assured Lauriette that she would obtain the key and return as quickly as possible. Panicking, Lauriette desperately tried to stop Anne, fearing for her safety. However, her efforts were in vain. Realizing there was nothing she could do, Lariette slumped against the door overwhelmed with a sense of helplessness. As Lariette shut her eyes, out of nowhere, the door was slammed open, sending Lariette flying. Duke Blanche and Rand stormed into the room, trying to throw their weight around and show their power over Lariette. Rayan, with his face all bruised up, had a smug grin when he saw Lariette in her sorry state. Lariette couldn't help but wonder what had happened to Rayan's face but she couldn't deny that the bruises actually made him look kinda good. Duke Blanche marched toward Lauriette, bl blabbering about his brilliant plan to trap her and make her reflect on her mistakes. But looking at Lauriette now, he thought she didn't give a damn about regretting anything. Trying to get back on her feet, Lauriette called him out on his nonsense, claiming she hadn't done anything wrong. This boldness ticked off Duke Blanche even more. He used his power to slap Lariette hard across the face, knocking her off balance. Lariette trembled, fighting to stay on her feet. Duke Blanche grabbed her shoulder, refusing to give her a moment to catch her breath. The thunder roared, drowning out the sound of Lariette's body hitting the ground amidst the crashing of chains. Duke Blanche exploded with anger, ranting about the money he had spent to raise Lariette properly only for her to escape to that monster Duke's house. He accused her of disrespecting her father and claimed that she had instigated Duke Kendall to harm Rayon. With a dismissive wave, he declared that Lauriette wouldn't leave that room until she realized her mistake. As Duke Blanche stormed out, Rayon, still lingering, wore a wicked grin and approached Lauriette. 
He gloated about her current predicament, blaming her for insulting him. Grabbing Laureate's clothes and yanking her up, Rayon faced her bruised face with satisfaction. But even with her battered appearance, Laureate stared him down with a fierce look. And suddenly, Rayon let out a piercing scream. Ah! Laureate fearlessly sank her teeth into Rayon's hand, drawing blood. Caught off guard by Laureate's boldness, Rayon recoiled, feeling a mix of terror and anger, claiming that Laureate had lost her mind. But Laureate didn't back down. She showed no sign of fear and even spat in front of him, leaving Rayon even more shocked. Overwhelmed with fear, Rayon quickly fled from the room. In a panic, he instructed Joel to lock the door, accusing Laureate of being insane due to her association with Duke Candle. Before locking the door, Joel took a quick glance inside the room, his expression remaining indifferent. Lariat couldn't keep her balance any longer and collapsed onto the ground. Helpless and lying there, memories of Azrahan flooded her mind. She remembered his infectious smile that could instantly brighten her day, the way he showered her with love and cared about every little detail of her life. It made Lariat feel deeply loved by him. Tears streamed down her face as she helplessly longed for Azrahan's presence. Out of nowhere, Anne's voice startled Laureate. It was a voice that brought a spark of hope, causing Laureate to lift her head in anticipation. Anne shared the incredible news that she had found someone who could rescue Laureate. In an instant, Laureate's tears vanished as Anne revealed that none other than Duke Candle himself was on his way to save her. In a disheveled state, with a pale complexion and an intense gaze, Azrahan, accompanied by his loyal guard Gerard, approached the Blanche residence. He was determined to retrieve Loria and bring her to safety. Noticing an uninvited guest approaching his residence, Duke Blanche, with Joel trailing behind, appeared visibly upset by the situation. He didn't hesitate to express his displeasure, claiming that Azrahan was audacious for showing up at his house without prior notice. Gerard, observing the scene from behind Azrahan, grew irritated by Duke Blanche's disrespectful attitude. However, Azrahan, maintaining his intimidating gaze, calmly stated his purpose for being there, to retrieve his beloved. Duke Blanche hesitated for a moment, unable to fully comprehend what Azrahan meant. But Azrahan reiterated his intention clearly, emphasizing that he had come to take Laureate back with him. Now face to face, Duke Blanche still failed to recognize the true extent of Azrahan's power. He looked down upon Azrahan, accusing him of stealing his daughter. Sensing the imminent danger, Duke Blanche began to feel a twinge of intimidation in Azrahan's presence. Azrahan clenched his fists and firmly stated that it would be wise to bring Lariat back peacefully, as he was prepared to do whatever it took to reunite with his lover. Meanwhile, Lariat forced herself to get up even though she was still wobbly. She then asked Anne to confirm if Azrahan was actually present. Anne explained that she had sought Joel's help, and it was Joel who had messaged Duke Candle. Laureate made her way to the nearby window while Anne assured her that Joel had done it discreetly. With her skinny hands still handcuffed, she finally reached the window and caught sight of Azrahan. Her heart filled with hope as she saw him being insulted by her father, knowing he had come to rescue her. Luriet figured out that Azrahan couldn't see her from outside. So, she quickly came up with a plan, grabbed a nearby curtain, yanked it off the rod with all her strength. She rolled the curtain around her hands, making sure they were well covered and smashed through the window. Wow, the power of hope is truly something. Without hesitation, Luriet stepped out of the window, not even the broken glass could stop her. Finally, she reached the balcony, the way out of her nightmare. She shouted at the top of her lungs, calling out to Azrahan, who turned his head and was utterly shocked to find Lariette there. Her determination to escape that house was undeniable, and now she was ready to jump off the balcony. As Azrahan saw his beloved flying through the air, he instantly sprang into action to catch her. Meanwhile, Joel snapped his fingers, casting a spell that created a shield, slowing down Lariette's descent. 
Azrahan spread his arms wide, prepared to catch her. As Laureate fell into Azrahan's arms, she experienced an indescribable happiness. I can't even find the right words to explain it, but I can feel it. I'm so relieved that her nightmare didn't last more than one chapter here. Phew! Azrahan caught Laureate safely, and they both shared the same joy. When Azrahan noticed the bruises on Laureate's face, his expression turned dark, and he demanded to know who had hurt her. Oh no! It looked like Azrahan was on the verge of losing his temper. He then turned his gaze towards Duke Blanche, his eyes filled with a deadly glare. The dark aura emanating from Azrahan terrified both Duke Blanche and even Joel, who was innocent in this situation. While carrying Laureate in his arms, Azrahan declared his intention to kill Duke Blanche. Laureate gently caressed Azrahan's face, trying to calm him down. She pressed her forehead against his and whispered for him to leave with her, assuring him that she wanted to go back to their home. When Azrahan heard this, his eyes lit up with joy. He was thrilled that Laureate now considered Candle's residence as her home too. However, Duke Blanche was taken aback by the affectionate couple in front of him. He tried to intervene and prevent Laureate from being taken away by Azrahan. This annoyed Azrahan who gave Duke Blanche a fierce glare, silently warning him that if he dared to come any closer, he would be crushed into pieces in no time. Laureate, who was in the most pain, turned her face away from her father. Duke Blanche was shocked by Laureate's current state and couldn't believe he had caused her so much suffering. Are you kidding me? Joel, who was still standing behind Duke Blanche, flashed a gentle smile, indicating his relief that Laureate was now safe. Grateful for his support, Laureate smiled back at Joel. She was truly thankful to have him by her side as he had always been there for her. She promised herself not to forget his kindness. Finally, Lariette could breathe the fresh air once again, having escaped from her hellish family once more. Azrahan, you forgot to remove the handcuffs from Lariette's hands. Oh well, thanks anyway. Now I can proudly say that Lariette was finally free. Upon reaching the Candle residence, Halstein appeared shocked and immediately called for the priest. Just as we expected from our old man. Azrahan gently laid Lariette on her bed and started examining her. Suddenly, Lariette's cheerful self resurfaced as she called out his name and wrapped her hand around Azrahan's neck. She expressed her gratitude to him for rescuing her. Azrahan couldn't help but wonder why she still wore a smile despite being injured all over. She even thanked him without blaming him for arriving late to save her. Earlier, when Azrahan received the message from Joel, he had been ready to crush the Blanche family for daring to take Lariette away from him. Feeling remorseful, Azrahan hung his head, unable to meet Lariette's gaze. He apologized for arriving late, but instead of responding, Lariette gently tilted his head up. Then, out of the blue, she asked for a kiss, expressing her sincere desire to have it right then and there. Azrahan couldn't refuse her request, as he felt the same longing. Laureate pulled Azrahan's face closer, and they shared a passionate kiss, finally reunited after a day apart. Their kiss deepened, releasing all the pent-up emotions. Suddenly, Laureate flinched, causing Azrahan to worry if he had hurt her lips. But she showed no sign of stopping and demanded even more, declaring that it wasn't enough. This might just be the longest kiss they've had in the entire video I've made! Azrahan grabbed her waist, pulling Laureate onto his lap, and they continued kissing each other passionately. Okay, now they had to break apart to catch their breath. Lariette's face was a mix of bruises and flushed cheeks, and she seemed out of breath. But Azrahan, despite his concern for her well-being, was consumed by his desire, pleading for more kisses. With his arms still wrapped around Laureate's back, he pulled her even closer, seeking permission to kiss her more. He explained that no matter how much they kissed or for how long, it would never be enough for him. He even entertained the thought of taking things further than just kissing, wanting to make Laureate his and his alone. However, Laureate also seemed caught up in the moment. She expressed her deep love for Azrahan, but then realized that she shouldn't allow herself to fall for him completely. 
She knew she had limited time left to live, and the thought of parting ways would only cause pain in Azrahan's heart. Despite being aware of this, Lariette couldn't help but get carried away and fall deeply in love with Azrahan. And there they were, continuing their passionate kisses. Azrahan poured out his love for Lariette, confessing that he was deeply and madly in love with her. Just her mere presence brightened his days and her words had the power to drive him crazy. This was a completely new experience for him, feeling both loved and in love with someone. Their kisses grew even more intense, and well, you can probably guess what might have happened next if they were in that position. Let's just say it's better left unsaid here, but I'm sure you know what I mean, right? Suddenly they stopped kissing, sensing a sense of urgency, particularly from Azrahan. Swiftly, he moved Laureate back to the bed and pinned her down. Unable to express the depth of his feelings through words, Azrahan chose to show it through his actions. Excitement and a hint of fear mixed within Lariette, leaving her speechless. She lay there silent as Azrahan, still on top of her, drew closer, signaling that he was about to take their connection to another level. Lariette's heart was racing like crazy, even though she still had visible bruises on her face. The blush on her cheeks couldn't hide the bruises. Azrahan had her pinned down on the bed, and she wondered if she would be okay with it. Resting his face on Lariette's body, Azrahan admitted he couldn't hold back any longer and felt like he was losing his mind. But then he regained his composure and realized it wasn't the right time, so he had to hold himself back. He was concerned about Laureate's well-being and worried that his curse could make things worse. Azrahan hesitantly lifted his head, but Laureate reassured him that they could have their moment another time. Caught up in the situation, their faces drew closer to each other. Suddenly, Halstein burst into the room, calling out their names. With a beaming expression, he informed them that the priest had arrived. You can probably imagine the couple's reaction to that, right? Doha, with a dark and intense vibe, straight up asked Laureate who had the guts to hurt her like that. He didn't even bother hiding his true expression, unlike his usual self. Laureate hesitated to reveal the truth while Doha tried to mask his emotions and said that he had warned Laureate about not getting hurt, expressing his disappointment that she didn't listen. He glanced at Lariette's wrist, and she noticed his gaze, explaining that she kept the bracelet he gave her because it was pretty. Doha still felt annoyed about what happened to Lariette and wondered which part of her was hurt. He was in a bad mood, especially seeing her swollen lips. Suddenly, he pulled Lariette's head closer to his and started the healing treatment. While healing her, Doha asked if it was Azrahan who caused the harm, but Laureate quickly clarified that it wasn't Azrahan who hurt her. In fact, Doha was just about to ask if her swollen lips were because of Azrahan. Laureate also revealed that she had been kidnapped. Upon learning the truth, Doha felt sorry for himself that he couldn't protect Laureate as he had promised. The bruises on Laureate had completely healed and Doha asked if she felt any pain elsewhere. She replied with a no. Sporting a smile, Doha told Laureate to always wear the bracelet claiming that it aids the healing process. Lariette reluctantly agreed. Doha still examined Lariette closely and gently touched her face, instructing her to stay still as he cast another healing spell on her face. In his head, Doha was thinking that if he gave in to his desires, Lariette would probably end up hating him, and the idea of Lariette having some kind of disdain for him was oddly exciting, but he didn't want to ruin their good relationship. Out of the blue, Lariette flinched, and Doha quickly asked if she was hurt anywhere else, noticing something on her feet. But Lariette assured him that she was fine. Sensing that something still wasn't quite right, Doha gently picked up Lariette's foot. He carefully removed the glass shards stuck on her feet. However, all Lariette could think about was how dirty her feet must be and how she didn't want Doha to touch them. She didn't let on to Doha because she believed he must have been raised to be more refined. But the truth was, Doha had never received any decent treatment from others since he was a child. He had always been a lowly commoner who was constantly mocked and humiliated. The next day, in Azrahan's room. As Azrahan was getting undressed, he asked Lariette if she was feeling completely fine now. Lariette, sitting on Azrahan's bed, replied confidently that she was totally okay and fully healed. 
Azrahan, avoiding eye contact, expressed his concern that it might drain Laureate's energy. Upon hearing that, Lariat's face turned beet red. But then, shirtless, Azrahan turned towards Laureate and announced that he was ready now, so they could get started right away. Wait, get started with what? Nervously inching closer to Laureate, Azrahan awkwardly knelt on the bed, facing her. Laureate slowly reached out to touch Azrahan's body and began the purification treatment on his upper body. Ah, so it was for purification. Phew, I thought my mind was going in the wrong direction. Finally finishing the treatment, Lariette cheerfully declared that the purification on his upper body was now complete. Seeing the curse gone, Azrahan was still in disbelief. He thanked Lariette for the purification, feeling a mix of emotions and disbelief that he finally had hoped to live a normal life. Lariette gently kissed his cheek and assured Azrahan that even though it was too early to celebrate, she promised to completely remove the curse soon. With a bright smile, Laureate announced that they would move on to the next purification on Azrahan's lower body. But suddenly, they found themselves in an awkward situation. Laureate turned her face away, hiding her shy expression, while wondering how to ask Azrahan to take off his pants for the purification. She quickly came up with an excuse saying that she needed to take a break after the purification, so they could do that next time. However, feeling embarrassed, Azrahan reluctantly stated that his lower part was fine, and he just wanted to make sure Lariette didn't misunderstand. But his sudden explanation only made things even more awkward, and Azrahan regretted saying anything. To make it even weirder out of nowhere, Lariette's stomach growled loudly. Azrahan suggested they eat together, adding to the strange situation. In her room, Lariette lay on her bed, her mind filled with thoughts about recent events. She couldn't help but feel grateful that Azrahan saved her when she was kidnapped by her own family. The most important thing was that Joel and Anna had also helped her. She wondered if she could bring them here now, but at the same time, she worried if her time in this world was coming to an end. Lariette regretted being so obedient to her parents all this time, feeling like a fool. If she hadn't known her life was limited, she wouldn't have felt this newfound sense of freedom. As her happiness grew, the thought of dying became less and less appealing. She thought about Azrahan and what she liked about him, his gentle and sweet side that nobody else knew, and how he would express his jealousy. Laureate realized that her feelings for Azrahan were growing deeper. She felt a sense of relief thinking that Azrahan might not love her as intensely, so he would be okay even if she was no longer around. Feeling a mix of relief and sadness, Laureate let out a heavy sigh. But out of nowhere, a massive thunderclap roared, sending a wave of terror through her. It was as if she could still see her father standing before her, ready to strike whenever the thunder struck. The haunting memories of her past trauma resurfaced, causing her to cover her ears and shut her eyes tight. She screamed at the top of her lungs, trembling with fear. Determined to escape that situation, Lariette mustered up her courage and bolted out of her bedroom, desperately searching for someone to help her. She kept running until suddenly, Azrahan appeared before her, looking confused and concerned about what he witnessed. Laureate, still pale and trembling, couldn't find the words to explain. Shocked, Azrahan asked her what had happened, urging her to come inside his room. Still shaking, Laureate sat down while Azrahan sat beside her. He asked if she wanted a hot tea and assured her that he would prepare it right away. He then inquired if Laureate was feeling sick or something. Trembling, Laureate confessed that she was terrified of the sound of thunder and that she couldn't bear to be alone in this kind of weather. But before she could say more, another deafening thunderclap interrupted her, causing Laureate to instinctively jump into Azrahan's arms. Seeing how scared she was, Azrahan embraced her tightly, trying to soothe her trembling form. Thinking back to his own traumatic experiences during the war, where he had encountered someone desperately in need of help, Azrahan couldn't help but be stunned by the current situation. Comparing it to the past, when he had felt helpless, seeing Laureate trembling and seeking solace in him made him realize that this time he didn't want to let her go. Laureate hesitantly asked if she could sleep with him that night, clarifying that they would only hold hands. Blushing, Azrahan was left speechless, which made Laureate think he didn't want to. She quickly apologized, saying she would sleep on her own if she had asked for too much. However, as Laureate started to move away from Azrahan, 
Suddenly, a loud thunderclap startled her, causing her to cover her ears and eyes. But before she could react, Azrahan pulled her into his embrace, his worried expression evident as he looked at Lariette. Meeting his gaze, Lariette reassured him that she was okay now, expressing her gratitude with a smile. As Azrahan gently caressed her hair, he unexpectedly suggested that Lariette should sleep in his room. Resting her head on his comforting hand, Lariette thanked him. Finally, they both lay on Azrahan's bed together. Lariette reassured Azrahan that she wouldn't do anything to scare him, but Azrahan, his body tensed, claimed that he wasn't afraid of her. Hearing his words, Lariette playfully teased him, poking him and pointing out that his scared expression was written all over his face. Azrahan, covering himself with his arms, pleaded with Lariette to stop. However, Lauriette didn't give up and continued teasing him by poking him all over. Suddenly, Azrahan grabbed Lauriette's wrist, pinning her down on the bed and begged her to stop. With a helpless expression, he explained that he was trying not to do anything to her, which was why he was pleading with her. Just then, a thunderclap boomed, causing Lauriette to tremble in shock. Azrahan noticed that despite her fear of the thunder, she was still trying to act fine by teasing him. Slowly, he intertwined his fingers with Lariette's, silently communicating that he wanted her to lean on him and trust him with everything. Shifting his body slightly while still holding hands, he wrapped his arms around Lariette, pulling her closer to him, hoping to ease her worries. In Blanche residence, Duke Blanche was absolutely livid, throwing everything within reach in a fit of anger. He was furious because despite multiple attempts to call for a priest, none were available to come. Nervously, the servant explained the situation, stating that they had made countless calls but had been met with rejection each time due to the unavailability of priests. Duke Blanche's anger only intensified upon hearing this reason, and he couldn't believe what he was hearing. He recalled Gerard informing him that Lariette had no injuries, and the Duke had considered releasing her to avoid any rumors about his mistreatment of his own daughter. However, Gerard seemed to know exactly what Duke Blanche had been contemplating. At that moment, Rayan happened to be descending the stairs and witnessed his father conversing with Gerard. Memories of his own kidnapping by Azrahan flooded Rayan's mind, along with the accidental fall that had resulted in his broken legs. Now, with the dire situation of his beloved son's injury, he couldn't help but wonder what they should do in the absence of a priest. He started to blame Lauriette for not being present when they needed her, as he believed she could have healed Rayan. Unable to bear the weight any longer, Duke Blanche made up his mind to visit the temple immediately. In the Altheon Temple, Duke Blanche caused a scene, demanding that the priests there treat his son. He couldn't wrap his head around the fact that there were so many priests present, yet none of them were available to help his son. The situation only fueled Duke Blanche's anger, making him even more furious. Out of nowhere, Doha appeared and inquired about what was going on. The priests immediately bowed down to greet him, which caught Duke Blanche off guard. With a piercing gaze, Doha once again asked for an explanation of the situation. Finally, the moment he had been waiting for had arrived, an opportunity for him to seek revenge for what had happened to Lauriette. Feeling all jittery standing in front of the high priest, Duke Blanche tried not to screw up. He said sorry for causing a scene while Rayon, totally clueless, blamed the lousy management in Altheon. Duke Blanche quickly cut in, explaining that his son needed treatment, but no priest showed up, which is why they just showed up unannounced. Truth is, Doha had forbidden all the priests from helping them. Doha swiftly changed his expression and grinned, admitting that his priest messed up. To make amends, Doha offered to treat Rayon himself. Yeah, those shady eyes tell you exactly what he's planning for Rayon, right? But Duke Blanche acted all thankful, as it was an honor to be treated by the next pope. In his sneaky mind, he saw this as a golden opportunity. Something even Duke Candle couldn't get, and he even thought about using Doha to boost his own name and status. Without wasting any more time, Doha told Rayan to come along. But just before Rayan left, Duke Blanche leaned in and whispered to him, Hey, you know Doha's gonna be the next pope, right? So be on your best behavior. Off they went to Doha's room. Inside, Rayan couldn't help but snoop around a bit. Out of the blue, Doha asked how Rayan got hurt, and Rayan casually replied that he tripped by accident. 
Doha got closer and quickly grabbed Rayan's hand to check the scar. It was a bite mark from Laureate from before. Doha seemed to find it amusing, imagining Laureate's tiny mouth biting Rayan's hand like that. But Rayan was annoyed, yanked his hand away, and Doha just smiled and said, sorry. While casting the magic spell on Rayon, Doha couldn't get that cute bite mark out of his mind. Still, he knew he couldn't let Laureate's mark stay there. Once the bite mark completely healed, Rayon couldn't resist making a snarky comment about Doha being a commoner. There was this rumor going around that the next pope, Mikhail Doavelian, was the son of a street prostitute. Rayon muttered about the rumor, annoyed that someone like Doha, who came from humble origins, could be part of the holy temple. Hearing Rayan look down on him, Doha just smirked and mentioned that Duke Candel seemed to be going soft if he allowed a brainless trash talker like Rayan to be around. Leaning in closer, Doha suggested that maybe some part of Rayan's body needed to be broken to make him act nicely. Naturally, Rayan got ticked off by Doha's words and stupidly launched an attack. But Doha effortlessly dodged, tackled Rayan's foot, and bam. Rayan ended up kissing the floor. Smooth move, Doha! As Rayan lay on the floor, he couldn't help but wonder how Doha easily dodged his punch. Doha, seemingly reading Rayan's thoughts, explained that growing up on the streets made it too simple to avoid such a weak attack. Stepping closer to the dizzy Rayan, Doha asked if his head was hurting. Rayan trembled, asking what Doha had done to him. Doha revealed that he had messed with Rayan's mana, and if left untreated, it would explode in a few months. Helpless and still trembling, Rayan groaned in pain. Doha added that unless Rayan's abilities surpassed his own, he would never be healed. And, well, there was no one like that around. So Rayan better be wise from now on. Desperate not to meet an explosive end, Rayan begged for mercy, asking what he should do. Doha extended his hand and declared that if Rayan ever laid a finger on Lariette again, that day would be his funeral. Meanwhile, in the morning, Lariette woke up in awe, her mouth watering as she appreciated the magnificent view in front of her. Yep, it was Azrahan who never failed to make our hearts flutter. And that pretty face in the morning was the real deal. Gathering her composure, Loria asked if Azrahan had managed to get any sleep last night, as he looked pretty tired now. To be honest, Azrahan couldn't even close his eyes. So yeah, he definitely hadn't slept at all. He turned to Loria and asked what she had planned for the day. Loria, casually moving her blanket, mentioned that she planned to see Doha, unintentionally showing her thigh. Yeah, poor Azrahan's face turned all red, and he quickly looked away while trying to respond to Laureate. But she didn't stop there. Laureate happily added that after that, she planned to sleep with Azrahan. After that statement, Azrahan paused for a moment, taken aback by her sudden openness. But Laureate couldn't stop laughing at Azrahan's response when she teased him. She kept teasing him, and Azrahan felt a bit relieved thinking that if one night could keep him awake, he wouldn't survive the next one. Holding his face, Azrahan stepped out of his room, only to be surprised by Halstein already there, with tears in his eyes. Halstein stammered, saying he always believed that a day like this would come. Azrahan just stood there, saying nothing, only observed Halstein. Halstein even started to imagine Azrahan and Laureate's wedding day, asking Azrahan about the date and what kind of dress and suit they would need. He kept going on about wedding stuff, but he stopped abruptly as Azrahan covered his mouth with his hand, begging him to stop. Halstein quickly made up a reason that since Azrahan was busy, the wedding should be prepared in advance. However, Azrahan, still tired from not sleeping well, questioned himself in his mind if he deserved marriage feeling like he wasn't worthy of getting married, but at the same time, hoping and eagerly waiting for his wedding with Laureate, Azrahan made a vow in his mind to spend his life only with her forever. Blushing, Azrahan thought it was too early for such thoughts. He quickly clarified that he had no immediate plans to get married. Hearing Azrahan say this, Halstein was taken aback, wondering how come after they had slept together, Azrahan didn't consider marrying Laureate. Azrahan turned away, explaining that he didn't do anything to be responsible for, 
and that he was ending the discussion as he needed to leave. Halstein was even more shocked by this revelation. He couldn't understand how they had shared a bed but hadn't taken things further. He wondered if there was something wrong with Azrahan or if he was just too innocent, given that Azrahan's world revolved around war. Plotting something in his head, Halstein thought about how he might be able to help Azrahan. Laureate finally made it to the Altheon Temple without giving Doha a heads up about her visit. She asked one of the priests there if she could meet her friend, a low-ranked priest named Doha. The priest seemed puzzled. So, Laureate described how Doha looked, long silver hair and golden eyes. But as she explained, the priest's expression changed, realizing it matched his boss's description. Just then, Joshua rushed in, saying he knew who Laureate meant and he invited her to follow him. As she stepped inside the room, Laureate couldn't help but be amazed by how incredible it looked. She couldn't help but wonder if Altheon had loads of money, considering even a low-ranked priest like Doha had such a nice room. Suddenly, there was a knock on the door, and Doha entered, looking a bit disheveled, asking if something was wrong with Laureate since she showed up without any announcement. Behind that surprised look, he had actually changed his clothes in a hurry before. Laureate said she just wanted to surprise him, and Doha was genuinely surprised indeed. He then asked what brought her there besides the surprise. Hesitantly, Laureate explained that she needed his help. Doha wondered if she was just like the others who only came to him when they needed help. With excitement written all over her face, Laureate asked Doha to teach her how to use magic properly. Doha seemed a bit puzzled saying he was a priest, not a wizard, but Laureate insisted, saying that Doha was actually really skilled at magic. She then revealed that she was a purification wizard herself, even though Doha already had an inkling about it, despite her not mentioning it before. Laureate explained that she had a surplus of mana but never had the chance to learn how to use it. Her motivation was to be able to protect herself and stop feeling helpless in tough situations. She made it clear that Doha was the person she trusted the most. And that's why she sought his help. Smirking, Doha agreed to lend a hand. He leaned closer to Laureate and asked if she could grant his wish in return. Laureate took a moment to stop and said that granting all wishes sounded like a total scam, leaving Doha completely confused. She then got serious and asked, what if you ask me to dance and sing in weird clothes on the street? Doha couldn't help but burst into laughter at Laureate's unexpected remark. He quickly clarified that he only wanted his wish granted if it wasn't too much, and he trusted Laureate's judgment. He assured her that she could reject it if it was too overwhelming for her, and Laureate immediately agreed to the deal. Excitedly, she reminded him that now that the deal was sealed, they could start the lesson right away. As Doha agreed, Joshua came in and told him that someone had come to see him. Seeing Joshua's expression, Doha wondered if it was the old high priest who had arrived. He then apologized to Laureate for not being able to teach her that day. Laureate felt bad for dropping by unannounced, knowing Doha was busy. However, Doha reassured her that he would visit her soon. As they walked out of that fancy room, Doha thanked Joshua for letting them use it, and Laureate chimed in saying how awesome the room was. While saying her goodbye to Doha, Laureate couldn't help but wonder if Doha's situation wasn't great, considering he had to borrow a room from another priest. That made Laureate decide not to drop by unannounced like that again. As they waved back at Laureate, Doha whispered to Joshua, joking about his not-so-convincing acting skills. Joshua playfully retorted that he wasn't as sneaky as Doha, to which Doha countered that's just a basic skill all Altheon members should have. On their way to meet the high priest, Doha had this feeling that the old high priest, Gibral Faro, was probably out to find some fault in him. He thought maybe it was because the current pope wasn't doing too well, and Gibral Faro was worried that Doha might be the next in line for the position. So he was keeping a close eye on Doha, trying to figure out a way to bring him down. Back at Candle Manor, Laureate suddenly jumped on Azrahan as soon as they met. Azrahan instantly felt refreshed the moment he saw her, even though he had been feeling bored all day before that. He wondered if it was because Laureate, 
Being a purification wizard could cleanse his heart too. But their moment was interrupted by Halstein, who apologized as he informed them that there was a mistake, and all the blankets were being washed right at that moment. Trying his best to act, Halstein said that the good news was Azrahan's blanket was untouched. Azrahan casually asked why he didn't just buy a new one. But Halstein had a whole bunch of reasons, claiming that he had gone around different shops, but couldn't find any blanket with the same top-notch quality as the one they had. Now sporting his sad face, Halstein said he couldn't give Laureate the lower quality blanket. Laureate quickly responded that she was okay without a blanket, but Azrahan, knowing Halstein's scheme, told him to give his own blanket to Laureate instead. Laureate refused, but Azrahan expressed concern that she might catch a cold. Seeing the situation slip out of his control, Halstein suggested they sleep together again tonight. And surprisingly, Lariette immediately agreed. Azrahan was caught off guard, and as he tried to explain, Lariette interrupted, asking if he didn't want to sleep with her. Blushing and feeling worried, Azrahan couldn't come up with a good reason, but Lariette brushed it off and invited him to grab a meal instead. She assured him that she wouldn't touch him like yesterday, but we all know what happened to poor Azrahan, right? Following Laureate to the dining room, Azrahan thought to himself that he just needed to hold it together, and everything would be okay, that nothing should happen then. In his room, Azrahan was totally freaking out, knowing he'd have another night with Laureate. Then there was a knock on his door, and bam, there she was with that big smile, rocking her sleeping dress. And guess what? She brought cake too. As she placed the plate on the table, Laureate played a guessing game and asked Azrahan to guess what kind of cake she brought. Azrahan was racking his brain so hard but finally nailed it, whipped cream cake. Since he got it right, she asked if he liked whipped cream cake, and with Laureate looking all cute, he couldn't help but say yes. So, he fed her a piece of cake, but oops, some cream ended up on the corner of her lips. Laureate started hunting for a tissue to wipe it off. Worried she might say something that would make Azrahan run away again. But hold up. Azrahan surprised her big time. He pulled her face towards his, moving in closer, and said that she once told him he should be the one to wipe it off. Without any second thoughts, Azrahan wiped the cream off Laureate's face with a kiss. Laureate noticed that Azrahan's gaze looked like he was ready to devour her right then and there. So she quickly put a stop to it telling him she was done eating. But Azrahan pleaded for just a little more, saying he was still hungry, and they continued their passionate kiss. Suddenly, Laureate flinched, and Azrahan, who was on the brink of losing control, pulled his face away slowly. He noticed a worried expression on Laureate's face, so he put on a smile and said he was already full. Feeling nervous, Laureate abruptly stood up and quickly jumped onto the bed, covering her blushing face. Azrahan couldn't believe what he had just done, and he ended up stabbing his own thigh with a fork. Talk about being caught up in the moment! Still feeling embarrassed, Laureate called out to Azrahan and told him that she had to finish purifying him. Azrahan lay on the bed next to her and asked what she planned to do after the purification was done. Laureate admitted she had no clue yet. Then she bid him goodnight, as she wanted to get some sleep. As Azrahan watched Laureate sleeping, he couldn't help but think that she was his, and as long as she stayed by his side, he could handle all those feelings in him, the jealousy, possessiveness, and that desire to have her even more. But out of nowhere, Laureate rolled closer to him, hugging him in her sleep, and it caught Azrahan by surprise. Her body kept pushing against him, making him blush and feel all nervous. He thought about escaping from the situation, but he didn't want to wake her up, you know why, right? As he tried his best to stay calm, Laureate's legs suddenly wrapped around him, putting him in a state where he had no clue how to keep his thoughts straight. Azrahan was giving it his all to hold himself together, but man, he was trembling like crazy. It was like he wanted to scream for help, but nope, not a single sound came out. And the next morning arrived, Laureate woke up all refreshed, while poor Azrahan, for two days in a row, he had zero sleep. It wasn't just physically draining, but mentally too. Laureate noticed a note on the table and read Halstein's message, 
saying that the heavy rain last night had left all the blankets undried, so they should keep sleeping together for a few more days, and that meals would be brought to their room too. Azrahan heard that and felt like he was about to scream for help all over again. On the fourth day of sleeping together, Azrahan finally gave in and couldn't hold it any longer he crashed out like a dead guy. Laureate watched him, seeing how he slept so peacefully. She couldn't help but admire his face, even in his sleep. He looked stunning as ever. But then, Azrahan seemed to have a nightmare and called out for his mother. He appeared to be out of breath while sleeping. Laureate realized that she had never asked about Azrahan's parents before. All she knew was that they had passed away when he was a kid. She also knew that all the power and money they had was taken away by distant relatives. And after that, Azrahan spent his life in war with his cursed body. Laureate gently caressed his face, wondering how tough his life had been since he was a child, and how he never tried to take back what rightfully belonged to him. All she could do now was purify all the curses he carried, and she made sure to erase them all. She hoped that he could live a life like anyone else, having friends and not worrying about anything. Laureate mumbled that even though she had to go, she hoped Azrahan would be happy forever. But out of the blue, Azrahan grabbed her hand, looking all worried and asked what she had just said, wanting confirmation if she mentioned leaving him. Laureate tried to play it cool, acting innocent, even though her heart was like, ha. Huh. Azrahan kept insisting that he heard her say she was gonna leave. So, Laureate pushed him back onto the bed and assured him that he must have been dreaming or something. Deep down, she didn't want to leave, after all. Azrahan just liked her. It wasn't love, right? So she thought it wouldn't hurt him that bad. Trying to get back to sleep, Azrahan told her to stay with him forever. The next morning, when Azrahan woke up, he had this feeling like he had a nice dream last night. But he couldn't quite remember what it was about. Laureate rested her head on Azrahan's back, saying hi and mentioning that they could start the lower body purification soon. But as soon as the words left their mouths, they both got super embarrassed, realizing they were thinking the same thing. Trying to escape that awkward situation, Laureate suddenly got up, saying they could worry about lower body purification later. She also let Azrahan know she was heading to see Madame Charbet and reminded him about his palace errand. Azrahan seemed a bit bummed, thinking Laureate was right and that he'd be tied up if a war broke out, making it tough to hang out. But then Laureate turned to him, suggesting they do something together afterward. Azrahan got a bit anxious, hoping Laureate's idea wouldn't be too bizarre, and he agreed. Laureate grinned brightly, feeling overjoyed. She had this list in her mind, go swimming, hit the beach, check out the festival, hit the night market, groove at a dance party, and so on. So, the plan for today was to drop by Madame Charba's place. As per usual, Azrahan had Gerard playing the role of undercover bodyguard, talk about the overprotective boyfriend vibes. Now, Gerard might be this super skilled top tier knight, but even he couldn't figure out how he ended up in some situations that made him question his life choices. But hey, that's Gerard's deal. Let's switch back to Laureate for now. Madame Charba was all apologetic, explaining that she couldn't turn down a favor for Duchess Blanche, who wanted her to pass a letter to Laureate. But being her laid-back self, Laureate shrugged it off, telling her not to sweat it. To really prove her dedication, Madame Charbet went as far as to declare that she'd actually turned down the whole Blanche crew as customers for her boutique. Except for Floriette, of course. However, Laureate knew the Blanche bunch were broke, couldn't afford high-end boutique shopping. Just then, Laureate spotted a figure lurking in the shadows behind a curtain. She asked Madame Charbet if there was another visitor, sensing she might have walked in at the wrong moment. Laureate was about to bail, thinking she'd just come back later. But then a voice from behind the curtain piped up, and someone stepped out, blocking her retreat. Coming out of hiding, she gives Laureate a wave and a hey there. Long time, no see. Rocking that tomboy style effortlessly, this drop-dead gorgeous girl was none other than the princess herself. Laureate returns the greeting, feeling a tad jittery. 
The princess's name was Elizabeth, and rumor had it she'd been drop-dead gorgeous since birth and had a special place in the emperor's heart. Thanks to the Blanche family's loyalty, they had a tight bond with the imperial crew, so tight that the emperor had picked Rayan to be Elizabeth's fiance. Back in the day, when House Blanche was riding high and before Candle got his power back, they were the top pick among the Empire's three dukes. But Rayon, he'd always had this attitude, a real knack for belittling Elizabeth, which of course didn't sit well with her. To make matters worse, he even tried to play the whole women should know their place card on the princess, acting all high and mighty as her future hubby. But guess what? Elizabeth wasn't having any of that nonsense, so she gave Rayan a taste of his own medicine, quite literally knocking him off his high horse. That little showdown shattered their engagement into a million pieces. Since then, Elizabeth had sworn off any future fiancés. She had a way of scaring them off faster than a cat at bath time. Laureate hadn't crossed paths with Erzy for about five years, mainly because she'd gone out of her way to dodge her. But seeing Yerzy again, Lariette couldn't help but notice how much had changed in her during those five years. Erzy, all graceful and gentle, motioned for Lariette to lift her head. Radiating like a star that could practically blind you, Erzy casually mentioned that she had a hunch Lariette was tight with Madame Charbet. Trying to shield her eyes from Erzy's blinding brilliance, Lariette answered that Madame Charbet had lent her a hand a while back. With the realization that she was no longer a Blanche member, Laureate figured there was no need to steer clear of Erzy because of Rayon. With a cheerful grin, she asked Erzy to drop the formalities and just call her Laureate instead of Lady Blanche. Leaning in, Erzy gently ruffled Laureate's hair, sealing the deal and urging Laureate to use her first name too. Laureate was stunned by Erzy's ethereal beauty, and she couldn't help but get a bit drooly over that kind of gorgeousness. Chilling in the carriage, Laureate was pretty stoked that she'd managed to make some pals, even though she felt like her clock was winding down. She couldn't help but wonder why all the cool stuff seemed to happen right when she was about to clock out, making it super tough to bid them all farewell. She tried to reassure herself that it'd be all right as long as the connections weren't crazy deep. Lost in her thoughts, she dozed off. Out of nowhere, a knock on the carriage door jolted her awake. Doha was there, all like, why you still chillin' in the carriage? Stepping into the enchanting forest, Laureate was totally blown away by the scenery. Doha filled her in that this forest was like a hidden gem, hardly anyone swung by since it was miles away from the city. But according to Doha, it was the best magic learning territory. He gave Laureate the nudge to start flexing her magical muscles, like she used to. Laureate did her thing, and her magic stirred up the trees, giving them a little dance. Doha seemed kinda skeptical like he thought Laureate just burned a ton of juice for a minor trick. Then things got interesting. Doha took Laureate's hand and placed it on his chest, telling her to tap into her mana flow to check out his divine power rhythm. After that, he urged her to channel her power in a similar way and give the magic thing another go. But when Laureate tried to unleash her magic, it was still all sorts of wonky, and she worried Doha might catch some of the heat. Without missing a beat, she dove in to shield him. Even then, Doha had a hard time wrapping his head around it. He couldn't believe how Lariette, despite knowing he had way more firepower, would go all in to shield him. While keeping Doha safe under her magical shield, Lariette was totally tripping over her own wizardry. She was so hyped that she pulled Doha into a hug, all stoked about pulling off that spell, but, oh, their faces were way too close for comfort and they both froze in their tracks. Then Doha played it cool, giving Lariette props and calling out her smarts. Flashing that mischievous grin of his, he was like, you're not done yet, though. He laid out this whole list of magical tricks Lariette should master. But, honestly, Lariette was like a kid at Christmas, 
bouncing off the walls with excitement. As Lariette made her way back home, she mulled over today's magic lesson. In just a single day, she could sense her grip on her magic getting tighter. Sitting across from her, Doha had his own thoughts. He was kind of blown away that someone with such a magical gift hadn't been properly taught at Blanche. Watching Lariette genuinely enjoy their lesson made Doha's heart do this weird skip-a-beat thing. He started wondering if it was her magical genius that piqued his interest, even though he was typically the type to get bored easily. To break the tension, Doha switched gears and mentioned this festival happening in a nearby little town. There were plans for a night market, a flower parade, and even a masquerade ball. Doha was just about to invite Laureate when she beat him to the punch, eagerly revealing she was all in for a date with Azrahan at the festival. She threw in a thanks for the heads up, leaving Doha absolutely speechless. When the carriage pulled up at Candle's Manor, Laureate was all set to hop out. But just before she did, she turned to Doha and laid down some gratitude vibes. She told him that being his buddy was seriously the bomb, the best gift she could ask for. Little did she know, it was like a dagger to Doha's heart, a reminder that he was squarely in the friend zone. Yeah, poor Doha, he was stuck in that friend zone abyss and that's exactly why he was feeling all down in the dumps. Tough break, Doha. Inside the manor, Azrahan was already posted up, doing his best impatient act and calling out Laureate for being tardy. But Laureate brushed that off like a champ and dished about the upcoming festival that Doha had spilled the beans on earlier. With a grin that could light up a room, she laid it out for Azrahan, inviting him to be her partner for the event. But dude was all about his body's curse being a buzzkill. Lariette's heart sunk a bit, and she hit him with a legit heart-to-heart. -heart. When would they ever get to hit a scene like that? Next thing, she just whipped off Azrahan's shirt, revealing his curse-free chest. With her finger pointing and the million-dollar question, she pushed, now that the upper body curse was history. What was his hang-up? But then she pulled back, making it clear she wasn't trying to bulldoze him into anything. While buttoning up Azrahan's shirt, she pitched this cool idea. How about they hit the festival at night, giving them the perfect excuse to rock masks? One more time, she laid it on the line asking if he was down for the ride. And oh boy, Azrahan's face turned all shades of crimson, but he nodded. Game for the plan. At the festival, Laureate was having a blast rocking a bunny mask and juggling a big old cotton candy. With a megawatt smile, she threw out the offer to Azrahan, wondering if he was down to snack on some sugary goodness. Azrahan, feeling a tad on edge, managed a shy nod. And just like that, it was Date City. Laureate fed her adorable boyfriend cotton candy while they strolled hand in hand. Azrahan was totally going with the flow, following Lariette wherever she led, and agreeing to everything she wished. As they walked along, Azrahan couldn't help but notice people didn't look at him with disgust or fear anymore. It was like a total flip from what he was used to. He shifted his attention back to Lariette, and, out of the blue, laid a surprise smooch on her lips. He let her in on the secret, he really wanted to share that cotton candy experience one more time. But, oh, that spontaneous kiss threw Lariette off her game, especially since it was out in the open. She let Azrahan know she wasn't a fan, then kind of bolted, leaving him standing alone in the crowd. Lariette was seriously floored by Azrahan's sudden lover boy skills. Just when she was about to turn back to him, she caught sight of this random chick swooping in on her boyfriend. The lady was all like, Hey, you're flying solo? Wanna hang with me? Azrahan, in that moment, was kind of taken aback. It was his first time experiencing people not gagging at his scent. He was sort of zoning out, still trying to find Lariette, and he managed to decline the lady's offer. But here's the kicker. Lariette saw the whole thing from where she was standing. And then it was like a mini-marathon as she bolted, 
thoughts racing. She was thinking, like, if her time was up, maybe Azrahan was already starting to fall for someone else. And even though she got it, it was just a little hard to swallow that it might have happened so quickly. After huffing and puffing from her sprint, Laureate just stopped in the middle of nowhere, trying to talk herself out of feeling jealous. But then, out of the blue, someone hailed her from behind, this dude with flaming red hair and an alpaca mask on. He seemed concerned, asking if she was feeling sick or something. He insisted she take a seat and handed her a drink he had on hand. To put her mind at ease, he took a sip himself, showing her there was nothing funky in there. With her mask lifted, Laureate gave a heartfelt thanks to the alpaca-masked Samaritan. Seeing her without her mask, the alpaca-masked dude sort of freaked out, his palm practically plastered to his face as he muttered that he might be catching feelings right then and there. Oh boy, another contender for the second male lead slot? Or maybe sliding into third place? Rolling her eyes in annoyance, Laureate made it clear that she had a boyfriend. But this guy? He stayed all calm and collected, stating that the kind of line she just dropped was a classic rejection phrase, like the ultimate proof. Laureate was seriously scratching her head, wondering if this dude was freshly imported from the Wild West or something. Then, just when you thought he'd give it a rest, he decided to go big this time. He hinted that maybe he'd been a bit off before, so now he was going for the full-on dramatics. Dropping down on one knee, he went all poetic, talking about how her beauty had this vice grip on his heart, and he popped the big question, would she go on a date with him? It was like a throwback to some 15 years ago kind of love confession. Laureate was stunned. She couldn't believe someone was still pulling that old school move. But true to form, she shot him down again, this time with a firmer hand. Out of the blue, this surprise attack came at the alpaca dude from behind, but he totally brushed it off like it was nothing. Yep, the angry boyfriend was on the scene, swooping in like a hero. Azrahan's face had this whole mood switch as he glared, questioning how this alpaca guy had the guts to try and sweep his girl off her feet right under his nose. It was like the dude was asking for a one-way ticket to a world of hurt. The alpaca guy turned his attention to Azrahan, raising an eyebrow and asking Laureate if the dude attacking him was her main squeeze. But Laureate was still in total shock as she witnessed this alpaca dude casually blocking Azrahan's surprise attack like it was a walk in the park. Studying Azrahan with this critical eye, the alpaca guy had the audacity to state that he looked even more dashing and impressive than Azrahan. This time, Laureate's patience was wearing thin, and she couldn't help but get majorly ticked off. In fact, she whipped out her magic, basically giving the alpaca guy a not-so-subtle hint to back off, and sheathed that sword he was waving around in front of her boyfriend. Azrahan was like, totally caught off guard by Laureate swooping in to defend him. But the alpaca guy was all like, My bad. I didn't realize you were dead serious back there. He sheathed his sword and sort of shrugged it off, saying he thought Laureate was just bluffing, which is why he decided to pour out his heart. Laureate had had enough, though. She stepped right between Azrahan and the alpaca dude and was like, Look, rejection means rejection. She even wagged her finger at him, calling him out for being a cocky alpaca. Despite the alpaca guy's regret, he still let slip that he was kind of falling for Laureate. But alas, he admitted it just wasn't in the cards for him. With that, he turned on his heels and bounced, leaving Laureate standing there, still in her total guard mode. Wrapping his arms around Laureate from behind, Azrahan let his worries out, admitting he was kind of freaked out that she'd ditched him earlier. And the whole alpaca guy love confession? It got him thinking, like, what if Laureate actually said yes to that dude? The thought was like a nightmare he didn't want to have. Laureate gave his hair a soothing stroke and apologized, explaining she got lost while wandering around on her own. Then, her expression brightened up as she thanked Azrahan for hunting her down. 
It took Azrahan by surprise, and he asked her straight up if she'd really been holding out for him. Laureate's answer was crystal clear. Yeah. She turned to Azrahan, wrapping her arms around him and gave a heartfelt apology for the whole mess that went down. The music cranked up a notch, almost beckoning them to jump into the party vibes. Laureate threw it out there, inviting Azrahan to hit the dance floor with her. But there was the whole mass debacle, they'd lost theirs. Laureate was all about being considerate, wondering if maybe they should just bail. But Azrahan? He didn't even hesitate, just blurted out that he was totally cool with dancing maskless. Seeing how sure he was, Laureate wanted to be sure she wasn't dragging him into anything. She double-checked, asking if he was really, truly, no strings attached okay with it. And that's when Azrahan turned on the charm, giving her this soft, reassuring look as he told her he was okay. After all, being with her was all he needed. And so, there they were, back in the thick of the crowd. Laureate was all smiles, practically beaming from ear to ear as she grabbed Azrahan's hand and playfully yanked him towards the dance floor. Azrahan was on cloud nine, feeling like he'd just stepped into a whole new universe. This was uncharted territory for him. He'd never even dreamt about something like this. With his cursed body smelling like death warmed over, he'd been used to nothing but looks of disgust. But Laureate? She was like a one-way ticket to a fresh start, introducing him to a life he never thought he could have. She basically handed him a new lease on being human, pulling him out of that dark pit he'd been trapped in all his life. Before Laureate, the idea of dancing and having fun in a crowd was as far-fetched as it could get. Sure, Azrahan was a bit stiff on the dance floor, but he could tell that Laureate looked at him with such tenderness. How could he not fall head over heels for her? Their eyes locked, and in that moment Laureate spilled her heart out, confessing her love for him. Azrahan was ready to do the same, but then the boom of fireworks drowned his words. Caught up in the whirlwind of the moment, they were on the brink of sealing it all with a kiss. But out of the blue, Laureate used her hand to block Azrahan's lips, and without any hesitation, Azrahan playfully kissed her hand. Oh, those enchanting eyes of his, he fearlessly sent her a smoldering gaze. Consequently, Laureate's face turned as red as a tomato. She then turned away in a flustered manner, while Azrahan, assuming Laureate wasn't pleased, felt a pang of sadness. Noticing Azrahan's gaze falling to the ground, Laureate reassured him that her reaction didn't mean she disliked it. However, Azrahan seized this moment to ask for Laureate's permission to kiss her on the lips. Now, Laureate wasn't one to back down, after all, Azrahan had become quite adept at teasing her. With a seductive expression, teasingly asked if he was interested in spending the night with her. This unexpected proposal hit Azrahan like a ton of bricks, leaving him completely stunned. With a triumphant smile, Laureate quipped that if Azrahan wanted a kiss, he should have come prepared. Before Azrahan could even formulate a response, Laureate playfully reiterated that he was being punished. He had earned the privilege of kissing her for a while. Poor Azrahan, who was just about to embark on this new romantic chapter, suddenly found himself back at square one. The following day, as he was getting ready to head out, Azrahan casually brought up if Laureate was planning to stick to her old habits. Laureate, playing it cool, responded with a raised eyebrow, wondering what specific habit he was referring to. Blushing all over his face, Azrahan awkwardly tried to explain that she used to compliment him a lot and give him plenty of kisses before he left. Laureate, maintaining her composure, calmly stated that she wouldn't be going back to those ways reminding him once again about the punishment he had earned. Undeterred, he stepped closer, pleading if she could at least grant him a kiss. Leaning in just as their lips were about to meet, Laureate pushed him away, teasingly cautioning him not to rely on his handsome face to win her over. 
With a bit of a disappointed stride, Azrahan walked off, unable to secure his daily kiss. Meanwhile, Laureate sported a mischievous grin, thoroughly enjoying the sight of Azrahan practically begging for a kiss. This amusement led her to decide to prolong his punishment for a few more days. As for Azrahan, he discovered that he couldn't even last a single day. A few hours later, Laureate found herself in another magic lesson with Doha. Doha picked up on her cheerful expression and asked if she was in a good mood. Laureate, without much tact, attributed her happiness to Doha's suggestion about the festival the previous night. Feeling a bit downcast by her response, Doha swiftly shifted the conversation and dove into the lesson. All of a sudden, Laureate's memory jogged back to the alpaca guy from last night, and she shared the bizarre encounter with Doha. That peculiar alpaca enthusiast who had attempted to confess his feelings to her. Doha was caught off guard seeking clarification on what kind of confession she was talking about. With a hint of embarrassment, Laureate spilled, the alpaca guy had professed that he had fallen head over heels for her. Trying to lighten the mood, Laureate struck a playful pose and quipped that maybe it was because of her undeniable cuteness. However, Doha's reaction remained utterly poker-faced, leaving Laureate wondering if her attempt at humor had fallen flat, and somehow grossed him out. In reality, Doha was seething inside, annoyed at the thought of another guy vying for Laureate's attention. He mustered a forced smile, acknowledging Laureate's beauty, but beneath the surface, a surge of anger churned within him. Now it was time for the lesson. Doha glanced around and asked Laureate if she wanted to turn that forest into a mess like she did yesterday. Laureate felt a twinge of regret about the previous incident, and Doha reassured her that the magic lesson was sufficient for now, the upcoming lesson was focused on combat. Laureate's enthusiasm soared as she looked forward to this new lesson, eagerly querying Doha about what was in store. Doha outlined that she needed to start from the basics. Suddenly, Laureate's eyes widened in shock as Doha mentioned that the fundamental skill to learn was to kill. In a rather unexpected move, Doha placed Laureate's hand on his chest and instructed her to kill him right there. At first, Laureate thought Doha was playing around, but his serious tone indicated otherwise. Frustration and confusion welled up within her and she pushed Doha away, urging him to stop. Trembling with disbelief, she couldn't fathom how Doha was trivializing the value of a life, especially given her own limited time in this world, a life she deeply wished to preserve. Doha attempted to explain the rationale behind the lesson, but Laureate seemed to have already grasped the essence. Drawing from his own experiences, Doha shared with Laureate that the harsh reality of living on the streets wasn't as rosy as it might seem, and survival often favored the strong. Locking eyes with Laureate, Doha delivered a sobering truth. If they didn't possess the mindset to eliminate threats, they would likely find themselves on the receiving end of danger. Boom! Doha was seriously giving off some intimidating vibes. I mean, his life on the streets must have transformed him into this total wild card. Anyway, don't forget to smash that like button and drop a comment down below. Thanks for hanging out. Hope you had a total blast.